At the tail end of June, the US Supreme Court handed down a decision that is going to have enormous ramifications, not just for the US, but thanks to its impact on the ability of the federal government to regulate, well, pretty much anything, it's going to impact the whole world too. And no, if you're thinking about this, no, I'm not talking about the ruling that gives current and future presidents basically king-like immunity from prosecution that means they can... Okay, no, I mean, there have been a bunch of different rulings in the last year whose effects will be felt for generations to come, but this is a specific one. No, I'm talking about the Chevron deference, a ruling that came about from a court case that hit the court back in 1981 and which now is no more because the current non-elected kingmakers of the court have decided it's time to make in 2024 1984. So yeah, let's talk about the Chevron deference, what it is, and why it matters that it's gone away. Today we shall mostly be talking about politics, and I know that some people will be very angry about that fact, but in this case I promise this is something we all need to understand and know about, because as Nikki is fond of saying, politics affects our entire lives, and in this case the pale blue dot we live on. And while it would be wonderful to have Slarty Bartfast pop up and tell us not to worry because this is all just a giant experiment run by mice, that's sadly pretty unlikely, at least in our iteration of the multiverse, and I have tried making a really hot cup of tea, and I didn't get an improbability drive. This is going to be a bit long and kinda complicated, but I promise it's really important to EVs, so stick with me. So the first question here is, what is the Chevron deference? Well, back in the early 80s, the Reagan government's Environmental Protection Agency changed the way it interpreted the rules around air pollution. Before Reagan was elected, the EPA, and as a reminder, the EPA is a Republican creation, it had required an approval process for any significant change at a plant or site that would produce more air pollution. But the EPA under the Reagan administration said that even if a change produced new air pollution, that was okay so long as a reduction of the same amount was made at the same site. So in 1981, the National Resources Defence Council challenged that. It challenged the new interpretation, and it won. This upset corporations that like to pollute and destroy the environment. And so, I'm sure in a completely unrelated move, the Chevron Corporation intervened, and the case wended its way to the Supreme Court where the NRDC lost. The Supreme Court ruled that the ambiguous nature of the word source in the Clean Air Act meant that Congress had delegated the power to make that policy decision to the EPA, and that the EPA's experts should be the ones who make and interpret the rules around that ambiguity. The court judgment said the power of an administrative agency to administer a congressionally created program necessarily requires the formulation of policy and the making of rules to fill any gap left implicitly or explicitly by Congress. If Congress has explicitly left a gap for the agency to fill, there is an express delegation of authority to the agency to elucidate a specific provision of the statute by regulation. A court may not substitute its own construction of a statutory provision for a reasonable interpretation made by the administrator of an agency. Which is a lot of fancy words that basically mean that the federal government can hand off making rules about things to agencies, and agencies can use their experience and expertise to fill in those vague twiddly bits. And that makes sense, because the world is an incredibly complicated place. In the early 18th century, if you were a well-read person of just the right breeding and <coughs> pallor, it was generally accepted that a judge, a wholesome and upstanding Christian pillar of the community, would have enough of an education to make informed rulings on any matter that happened across your desk. But now it's impossible to understand everything. 
and to be an expert in even how fairly basic scientific concepts actually function takes years, sometimes decades of study. A great example of this is biology, where people who last studied biology in high school and maybe got a D think that they know everything about the subject, then rant incoherently about it in our comments section, mainly revealing their lack of knowledge and frustrating a lot of people with more up-to-date and, shall we say, thorough understandings. So back in the 1980s, the Supreme Court passed a ruling that was the embodiment of a fairly wise and sage notion. The experts may know more on something than we do, and we're smart enough to know that we don't know everything. And at the very end of June, the current Supreme Court decided that, hey, it's beer o'clock, we are all experts. And we drink, yeah, we drank beer, and I said sometimes, sometimes probably had too many beers. Yeah. Anyway, in June's decision in Loper Bright Enterprises versus Raimondo and Relentless Inc. versus the Department of Commerce, the 40-year-old precedent went by the wayside as the court replaced the expertise of agencies and scientists with its own judgment. What do you consider to be too many beers? I don't know. Uh, you know, we, whatever the chart says, uh, on your blood alcohol chart. Chief Justice Roberts stated that it thus remains the responsibility of the court to decide whether the law means what the agency says, and that Congress expects the courts to handle the technical statutory questions, citing that the courts have the benefit of briefings from the parties and, quote, friends of the court. What this means in real terms is that the rules made by experts at federal agencies can be rolled back by judges with no more knowledge of their subject area than a cursory glance at Wikipedia, or indeed their Federalist Handbook would provide. And what that means is that any federal regulation that's a result of an agency filling in any areas of twiddly ambiguity is open for a court battle, and for a judge to overturn it. To see just how short-sighted and, frankly, ridiculous this idea that the judges know everything is, let's turn to Judge Gorsuch, who, in the very same ruling that obliterated the Chevron deference, conflated NOx, nitrogen monoxide and nitrogen dioxide, with N2O, or nitrous oxide, better known as that nice drug you give pregnant people when they're giving birth. One will make you care delightfully little about what's going on in the world. Believe me, I've had nitrous oxide and it is the only drug I've ever had where nurses had to take it away from me. Nox, however, will hasten your departure from the planet. Nitrous oxide is an anaesthetic. Nox are potent greenhouse gases that both increase ozone concentration, but also just for funsies, can damage lung tissue, are associated with increased heart disease, diabetes, infant mortality, respiratory distress, and much more. But for whatever reason, Gorsuch, as a Supreme Court judge, decided he knew more than scientists who've devoted their entire lives to studying these compounds and their effect on the planet. Maybe they've been having more beer parties since Kavanaugh arrived. With the overturning of this precedent, and federal agencies now at risk of being sued over pretty much any decision, it means that basically judges have ultimate control over all federal agency decisions. From what medications can be approved by the FDA, to what the EPA can and can't enforce. It means regulations about how much a vehicle can pollute, and thus whether or not it needs to be zero emissions, are now Fundamentally, a question that can be challenged and decided by judges with zero subject matter experience. The same also goes for the EPA's regulations intended to cut carbon emissions. And yeah, this is scary. Combine this with the judgment over presidential immunity, and we could see pretty much every agency decision or regulation pushed through the courts by wealthy corporations and individuals with the money to bring such cases. Which they will. In pretty much every single case that they think they can win. And that will depend up on the makeup of the courts. So everything from SEC regulations about how companies operate on the stock market, 
due to health, environmental protection, education policy, and even what interest rates will be, that could feasibly end up being decided by judges. Judges which, unlike federal employees and agencies, are partisan. These carbon-cutting regulations are reliant on the US's Clean Air Act, last revised in 1990, and which does not even include the concept of carbon dioxide as a pollutant, something that Michael Drysdale, an attorney specialising in environmental law at Dorsey and Whitney, suggests is likely to result in the rules being struck down. Last week, the court clarified the final piece, which is that plaintiffs can sue over regulations for up to six years after they are affected by them. Not merely for six years after the regulations take effect, which basically means open season on any federal regulation reliant on rules created by an agency, if you can find the right plaintiff. Okay, so the federal government's ability to regulate anything has been hugely hamstrung. Let's say a popular, albeit homophobic, fried chicken restaurant decides it wants to add lead as a low-cal sweetener to its drinks. The FDA would previously have said no, but now those regulations could be the subject of a court challenge and friends of the court could submit evidence that lead is fine, actually, indeed it's great, just look at the Romans. And depending on whether the judge thinks that's okay and how much low-cal sweetened drink they've had, you might find those regulations disappear. So a lot of regulatory stuff is going to be stuck in the courts and a lot of it is likely to be struck down. It's likely that as a result, a lot of these regulations will move to a state level. And when different states have disagreements about what the exact regulations are, expect the Supreme Court to be called in again. Of course, there's a whole states' rights argument to be had here, but this course has also shown a, shall we say, noodly tendency when it comes to the idea of interpretation of their rules being applied the same across the board. So while it might be states' rights for one thing, I fully expect them to be equally firm on, oh no, this definitely isn't a states' rights issue when it suits their desired ruling. Worse still, the Supreme Court takes a long time to make decisions. A plaintiff in a case that ends up at the Supreme Court can, and probably will, petition for a regulation that they're fighting against to be paused while the case is heard. Meaning that at best, everyone is in limbo for years, and at worst, new regulations designed to make the world cleaner, greener, safer, smarter, and more equitable will be tied up in knots for such a long time that will run out the metaphorical clock on so many important changes. And when it comes to the impacts on the rest of the world, well, the US's ability to act on climate change, to encourage adoption of cleaner technologies, that's going to be slower, more piecemeal, basically non-existent. Laggard countries will be able to point to the US and say, look, they're doing nothing, why should we? It's a huge body blow for our ability to move forward towards a cleaner and more equitable society. Well, what can you do about it? Well, like I say, at the state level, you can push your state legislature for stronger regulations. There are current moves to try and shift the balance of the Supreme Court, and talking to your legislators about those changes and saying that you support them may be in your interest. And of course, come November, if you're a citizen of the US, you can vote. And if not, make a noise. Make sure those who are citizens, who are able to vote, know exactly what's going on. Just like Project 2025, most people aren't aware of how extreme some of the policies people want to enact are. They're busy just trying to survive. Thanks for joining me today. And if you've got thoughts, make sure you leave them below in our Discord chat room, or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling by on your screen right now. They are some of the more than 1,500 people who help fund this channel through Patreon and YouTube, covering our bills, paying our team, and making sure that we can be 100% independent. 
If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just follow the links below. There's a range of different tiers you can sign up for from as little as $1 a month, or if you pay yearly, just under $11 a year. A huge welcome to our newest supporters, Carol Bulawa, Rodolfo, Michael Owen, Winter and Wilton Live. To join the list and get your shout out, become a paid Patreon member for your week of fame. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll find links below to make Kofi and Bitcoin donations, and we even have an old-fashioned PO box you can reach us at. Address is also down below. And if you're in need of some swag, you'll find our swag store in the down below too. This month, we're celebrating spring with an amazing t-shirt design by our in-house artist and animator, Erin. Get yours today by heading to our Redbubble store. We've got some great content coming up, so make sure you've subscribed on Peertube or YouTube, and we'll see you soon. We make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. If you want more, the mighty algorithm thinks you'll like this video, but we think this one is also well worth a look. See you soon, and as always, keep evolving!